in Bangladesh. A couple of questions. What does this say about moral leadership within an organisation like Oxfam? Would you expect it to be made public that you'd gone to a country to help out a damaged population and then used the services of prostitutes? What do you think about this situation? Well, it does require leadership. Um, you ha- even the best organisation in the world will always have the, the 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 metaphor, the bad apple. But when it comes to finding that, you have to be open. You have to be clear with everybody that what happened. So there, there can't be any sense of of trying to cover it up, because yes, it's going to hurt the organisation, but. Um, that's a question of your values with, that you share with everybody what you have to go through so that you make sure that that hurt is, is put right rather than try to cover it up and um, hopefully hope it doesn't turn up later on. God, it's PR 101, isn't it? And I mean, oh. putting the PR thing aside, um, y- you have to take the moral high ground in a situation like that. You just, uh, number one, it should never happen, but I think Ganesh is right. You cannot always be 100% sure that that's going to happen, but if and when it does, you have to own it and you, you have, have to, to manage yeah. it and you have to assure people that there are things now in place that will make sure that doesn't happen again and, and move forward. But you have to own it for the right reasons. Oh, yes, true. Yeah, yeah, not, you, not so not, that you look good. No, no I understand. Yeah. No, All right. right. Okay, but have times changed? The use of prostitutes while you're an aid worker has been defended by an aid worker on TV in the UK. Now, I was single. They they were willing to do it. Who's, who, what right of you or that Henry to criticise people like me? Judge me what I do the next day when I deliver a thousand tonnes of grain or, or food to starving kids. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, what is moral now? Uh, is it just plain wrong to go into a damaged country and pay for prostitution, or is that quite separate from your day job? God, that's actually hard to answer because my first gut reaction is that guy's a dick, and actually he has a responsibility to be setting a standard, but then I'm casting a judgment on what, you know, someone who uses the services of a sex worker uh, should and shouldn't be doing. I'm talking myself around in circles. I do not know. I do think that there's a standard that needs to be adhered to. That's my personal opinion. And I don't think that overseas workers should be um, using the services of sex workers. Okay. And you would, from what I can gather, you would agree with that, Gunny? Oh, undoubtedly. I mean, it's just wrong. Now, in passing, seeing as we do have an economist on the programme today, uh, Australia's attracting the bigger money, big money migrants. Uh, we're not doing that badly. We are attracting, of course, also students with no high net worth, according to MB. Wealthy migrants favoured Australia over every other country last year, according to the New World Wealth's uh, Global Wealth Migration Review. Australia snaffled 10,000 of the 95,000 high net worth individuals who moved countries last year. And as a result, the average Australian is now significantly wealthier than the average US citizen. Mm. It's interesting, isn't it? I've cut myself short of time. I just want to ask you a quick thing before we go. If you had researched both countries as a destination, Australia and New Zealand, maybe visited and had a good look, which country would you sooner live in? Oh, Oh, you're kidding. kidding. It's got to be New Zealand. Of course we're biased, but it's got to be New Zealand. Even though you're biased? Yeah. All right. Great. Can I just quickly say 9.30 tomorrow in Cranmer Square for the protest (laughs) gathering? Good Good luck for that. Thank you. Ali Jones has been on the panel. Thank you, Ali. And Ganesh Nana. Thanks, Ganesh. And we're back tomorrow. Thanks for your company, everybody. Checkpoint with John Campbell coming up shortly. everyone, welcome to Checkpoint. I'm Sharon Brett Kelly in for John Campbell. Tonight on the program, Simon Bridges, Judith Collins and Amy Adams are already out of the blocks in the race for the National Party leadership. A billion dollar blowout for Fletcher Building, the company's share price drops as it puts a halt on new jobs. Cyclone Gita is upgraded to a Category 5 storm as it tracks towards New Caledonia and Vanuatu. We speak to TVNZ's Pacific correspondent Barbara Drever, who's in Tonga for the latest on the damage there. And Associate Education Minister Calvin Davis comes out under fire following a complaint from an Auckland charter school group, which alleges he showed favouritism. 
RNZ News at five o'clock. Good evening, I'm Anna Thomas. Three senior MPs have now declared themselves contenders for the leadership of the National Party. Judith Collins, Simon Bridges and Amy Adams launched their bids today and, as political editor Jane Patterson explains, in quite different ways. Ms Collins was first out of the box on Twitter and straight onto morning radio, declaring the need for strong and decisive leadership. Mr Bridges used the more traditional approach of a media conference in the lobby of Parliament as the new generation candidate. But Ms Adams made the most dramatic announcement, marching up to the Rose Garden on Parliament's grounds flanked by four caucus supporters. Other possible candidates, Stephen Joyce, Mark Mitchell and Jonathan Coleman, are still considering their options. From Parliament, Jane Patterson. A village headman on the Fijian islands of Onoelao says Cyclone Gita's winds were the most frightening and dangerous in living memory on the island. Elaitia Tale Etaki says roofing iron was flying around, large trees were toppled and food crops were reduced to what he calls ground zero. He says older people all say it's the worst storm they've ever experienced and everyone is just happy to be alive today. Plenty damages. There are strong houses that they built, and uh, some of them has been badly damaged. We walk around the villages this morning, and we just walk around, and terrible things we've been seeing uh, happening. Eli Tia Tale Itaki says no one was badly injured because most people were in evacuation centres. The union for those working for Fletcher Building says it's unclear what impact the company's financial problems will have on its members. The company will stop taking on any further projects once it finishes work on 16 jobs still on its books. Its building division stock has now fallen 35% in the past year, wiping roughly $2.5 billion off its value. Air 2 says it hopes that if there are any redundancies, workers will be employed in other more profitable profitable parts of the company. Commenting on claims of incompetence by the outgoing chairperson Sir Ralph Norris, the union says it has heard from members about a lack of experience in project management from those at the top of the company. The health minister says thousands of mental health and addiction workers are to receive the pay they deserve. David Clark says the government has agreed to negotiate an agreement to extend the care and support pay equity settlement to people working in mental health and addiction. He says the health ministry will now begin formal talks with unions and employers. An Auckland police constable has told a court of finding valuable evidence during an after-hours visit to a crime scene where a woman was attacked. Constable Calvin Meek has been giving evidence in the High Court in Auckland where Colin Jack Mitchell is on trial, accused of abducting the woman from an Auckland street and driving her to a quarry where he beat and tried to sexually violate her. Edward Gay reports. Mr Meek, who was one of the first police officers on the scene, described the victim as looking as if someone had tipped a bucket of blood over her. He sat with her in the ambulance and she told him what had happened. He said when his shift ended, he returned to the area and walked up a gravel track where he found her shoes, phone and a pair of black gloves. The gloves would turn out to be a crucial piece of evidence for the Crown case. A DNA test gave a strong match to the accused. Itamaki Makoto ko Edward Gayaho. It's four past five. The weather continues to play havoc with Winter Olympic programs in Pyeongchang and has again delayed the debut of New Zealand's youngest Winter Olympian. It's the third time in the opening four days of competition that an alpine skiing event has been postponed due to the wind. Sports editor Stephen Hewson reports. 16-year-old Alice Robinson was due to make her Olympic debut on Monday in the giant slalom. However, that was postponed due to high winds until tomorrow. This afternoon she was due back on the slopes in the slalom but high winds have again caused scheduling problems with organisers forced to postpone the event until Friday. Meanwhile speed skaters Shane Dobbin and Peter Michael have announced they're withdrawing from the individual 10,000 metres in a bid to give them a better chance at winning a medal in the team pursuit. The 10,000 metres is on Friday with the qualifying rounds for the team pursuit on Sunday. The pursuit is seen as New Zealand's best medal chance at these games, with the trio of Dobbin, Michael and Rayon Kay ranked second in the world. This is Stephen Hewson.
Wanaka's Tony Dodds has been added to the New Zealand triathlon team for April's Gold Coast Commonwealth Games after dropping his appeal over his initial exclusion from the squad. Dodds was 21st at the 2016 Rio Olympics and 10th at the Glasgow Commonwealth Games four years ago. Manchester City have all but assured themselves a place in the quarterfinals of the European Football's Champions League with a 4-0 win over Swiss side Basel. And a Tottenham Hotspur drew a two-all with uh, Juventus in the first leg of their last 16 tie. And that's the news. Tonight on Nights, Simon Morris previews this year's Oscars at the movies. We have a BBC window on the world of the New Zealand artist, Lisa Rehana. Nick Tipping celebrates the mastery of Duke Addington during Inside Out. And Dexter Guff has more tips for your self-improvement. Leaders don't wait for people to say, please lead me. A leader steps in, uninvited, and fixes a situation. Relax and take charge on Nights with me, Brian Crump, after the news at 7 on RNZ National. And now uh, the weather forecast uh, from Met Service until midnight tomorrow. Northland to Taumaranui and Taihape, also Coromandel Peninsula, Bay of Plenty, Taupo and Hawke's Bay. Rain becoming widespread this afternoon with localised downpours and thunderstorms all easing this evening, becoming mostly fine tomorrow morning. Gisborne showers clearing and becoming fine tomorrow. Taranaki to Wellington also widened up a cloud and isolated showers clearing from most places tomorrow morning. Nelson and Marlborough mainly fine. Isolated showers about the ranges this evening. Buller, Westland and Fiordland remaining showers clearing and becoming fine. However, a period of rain spreading north tomorrow, briefly heavy in Fiordland. For Canterbury, areas of cloud and drizzle clearing tomorrow morning and becoming fine. Otago and Southland mainly fine inland today. A few showers elsewhere becoming confined to coastal, the coastal Otago this afternoon. Sorry, and brief rain everywhere tomorrow. And for the Chatham Islands, low cloud or fog, and occasional drizzle. RNZ National. It's seven past five, and you're listening to Checkpoint with Sharon Brett Kelly. Thanks, Anna. Three horses are out of the blocks in the National Party leadership race, with more MPs considering their options. Yesterday, Bill English told his caucus he was resigning as leader in two weeks and bowing out of Parliament altogether. And now it's a game on for his job. Here's our de de Deputy Political Editor, Chris Bramwell. Within a day of Bill English announcing it was game over for him, the race for the National Party leadership got underway in earnest. I've just announced that I will be a candidate for leader of the New Zealand National Party. I'm standing for leader. I'm focused on Simon Bridges becoming the leader of the National Party. Today I'm here because I am declaring that I'll be putting my name forward to be leader of the National Party. Simon Bridges, Judith Collins and Amy Adams have all announced they want the top job. Papakura MP Judith Collins was first out of the blocks this morning, announcing on Twitter that National needed strong and decisive leadership in order to win the 2020 election, and she was the person to deliver it. Leader of the opposition is the toughest job in politics. So I'm one of the few people in our caucus who's had any experience in opposition, and it is not going to be easy. But we do need to do that. I know I can get, I'm working, I've got a plan to get 61 votes at the end of 2020, and I believe that I can do it. It's not going to be easy, but I can do it. Tauranga MP Simon Bridges held a press conference on the first floor of Parliament House in a foyer dubbed The Tiles. He told reporters he was the person to lead National, as he has the right mix of experience and generational change. We do need to renew and refresh, and that means in policy terms. I think it also means in terms of our people, blending that experience that we've got that makes a real difference, but also with the the bundles of talent that we have in the National Caucus. Amy Adams chose the very visually attractive Rose Garden in front of the Parliamentary Library to throw her hat in the leadership ring this afternoon. But she also upped the ante by rocking up with MPs who were backing her, Nikki Kay, Maggie Barry, Chris Bishop and Tim McIndoe. Ms Adams stressed her point of difference from the other two candidates is that she offers a mix of urban and rural. Well, I've had 16 years practising as a lawyer, working in, in the commercial sector, running businesses, and I think that blend of urban and rural is a rare and unique capability that I bring to the job. But I'd also say that in my six years as Cabinet Minister, I've held ten portfolios, some very complex and, and difficult portfolios. Paula Bennett has made it clear she's not interested in the leadership job, but she would like to continue as deputy. I think I've got 
to add in the role of deputy. Um, it's a job I'm good at. It's a job that I love. So I appreciate that we've got an, um, a new leader. I'm not going to be endorsing anyone. I hope that I'm the right person to w- work alongside of them. But then again, you know, we might get further down the track and they might want to have a bit of a look at what they're doing and I can appreciate that as well. So there are three definite contenders for the leadership and one for the deputy. But wait, there could be more. I'm considering my position currently. I think we've got a big decision to make as a caucus. Um, I'm taking some soundings with colleagues, but also party members and supporters and people who have voted for us, so I think we're all doing that. Finance spokesperson Stephen Joyce not ruling out a tilt at the top job. I believe I've got some strengths, but again, it's not about me, it's about indi- it's about putting together a team. I'm happy to play a part in putting together that team, and if others felt that I should put my name forward, I would, but I haven't made any decisions. Jonathan Coleman is also keeping his powder dry. Oh, look, I'm uh, not doing anything immediately. Look, we've got nearly two weeks to go. A lot could happen over that period. I'm not ruling anything in or anything out. The important thing is National can win in 2020, and we've got to get the right leadership uh, combination to make sure we've got the best possible chance of victory. Another potential contender, the third-term MP Mark Mitchell, is also considering his options, though is not deciding right now. The leadership vote will be taken at the party's caucus meeting on Tuesday, February the 27th, after Bill English formally stands down. Atawiti Fari Pari Mata mō te hōtaka o te ahiahine, ko Chris Bramalahau. The former Corrections Minister Judith Collins was the first candidate to throw her hat in the ring. Sophia Duckor jones went to Papakura this morning to speak to some of her constituents about her prospects. I've never voted here, although I've been living here for 10 years, but I would love her to become Prime Minister. She is perfect for the role. I know her from upstairs. Obviously she comes down here not a lot um, because she's away working and she is very articulate extremely um, bright and she's down to earth. My memory of her is that a little while ago we celebrated 60 years of marriage. We got a number of congratulatory cards from various people including the Queen and one of them was from the Prime Minister and another one from Judith Collins. But not everyone was quite so enthusiastic about their local MP and her ambitions. Not very good. Just the things that she's done over the years, uh, the fact that um, a lot of us, we can't even get up to see her. She's upstairs. How does someone in a wheelchair get up to visit her? I have a girlfriend that's in a wheelchair and wish to speak to her and, and still can't. So if she becomes our new national leader, I will not never, ever vote national again. Big wow. national supporter, but not for her. I've never voted for her in my life, and I never will. And look, we've got something like 57 empty shops around here. Some of the shops here have been closed for five years, more than five years. It's just started to pick up a little bit now, I think. My wife never, ever shops here. Papakura voters speaking with our reporter Sophia Dakor jones A Valentine's Day massacre for Fletcher Building after a billion-dollar blowout. The company's share price closed 9.2% down today after it forecast even heavier losses in its ailing construction arm. The building products and construction firm has put aside $660 million to cover expected heavy losses from projects like the Auckland Convention Centre, $500 million more than it forecast in October. That will hit shareholders in the pocket, with Fletcher's cancelling its half-year dividend payout, while a fallout also claimed the scalp of its chair, Sir Ralph Norris. Our economics correspondent Patrick O'Mara reports. Fletcher Building's construction arm has disappointed investors for much of the last year, and today it delivered more bad news. Expected losses from its building and interior division have now blown out to $660 million, quadruple what it forecast in October. That will take the total losses from this section in the last two years to nearly $1 billion. Fletcher's chair, Sir Ralph Norris, blamed a failure of communication between management and the board, rising building costs and inaccurate quantity surveyor estimates for the heavy losses. We've had obviously a a significant building boom and often a boom is worse than a bust in many respects because it does put a lot of um, a lot of stress on supply of services, sub trades, product and the like. Fletchers won't pay a dividend either. Investors bailed out of the listed company with Fletcher's shares slumping as much as 14%. 
Its chief executive, Ross Taylor, is confident there will be no more financial shocks. He promised to finish all outstanding projects, including the Auckland Convention Centre, and says Fletcher's won't be seeking any new work in a sector marked by low margins and high risk. We realise that what we discussed today will be very disappointing for both our shareholders and the teams who continue to work hard to deliver results right across Fletcher Building. I want to assure you of the significant focus we will bring to bear on finalising these projects without further write-downs. I believe achieving this is absolutely possible. Fletcher's stock has now fallen 35% in the past year, wiping roughly $2.6 billion off its value. The chief executive of the Shareholders Association, Michael Midgley, says investors have borne the cost of the company's mistakes. That is shattering news and many, many New Zealanders are affected by that, by their Kiwi saver or their superannuation or the national superannuation. Fletcher's chair, Sir Ralph Norris, acknowledged the company had let investors down. He will step down a year early, saying he is taking the blame. In the final analysis, given the context of where we are today, I think that uh, it's appropriate, uh, regardless of what I think, from the point of view of how I've handled the situation, um, that you know, from the shareholder's perspective, um, the board does need to be seen as being accountable. The head of private wealth research at Craig's Investment Partners, Mark Lister, points out the rest of Fletcher's business is in good shape. Excluding the building and interiors unit, its earnings for the current financial year to June are expected to remain at between $680 and $720 million. Mr Lister is cautiously optimistic the company has finally staunched its losses. Investors will certainly be hoping that they've got to a point now where all of the bad news is out there and they've ring-fenced ring these problematic projects and they can get back to business and, and um, try and recover and get things back on track. Fletcher Building will reveal its half-year earnings result next week. For Checkpoint, Patrick O'Mara. Cyclone Gita has this afternoon been upgraded to a Category 5 storm, packing winds of 203 kilometres an hour as it tracks towards New Caledonia and Vanuatu. Fiji's main islands escaped damage, but Gita did pass over the southern Lao group of islands overnight, destroyed a number of homes and devastated crops and uh, plantations. In Tonga, the cleanup is expected to take weeks after the Category 4 storm flattened houses and ruined businesses. There was some welcome news today as the NZDF Orion touched down with 12 tonnes of much needed supplies, including hygiene kits, temporary shelters and water containers. TVNZ Pacific's correspondent Barbara Drever has been in the capital of Nukualofa since the cyclone struck. I asked her about the extent of the damage. The damage is still being assessed by authorities, but definitely from what I've seen, um, it, it is a, a lot of homes that have had their roofs ripped off and structures damaged. Uh, people are drying their clothes and you can see outside in the front yard you've got this destroyed house in the background and any little bits and pieces that people have managed to salvage that it's out drying in the sun and you've got what clothes, ripped clothes, um, all hanging up on the fence line as well. And and that is what's happening today. It's more of a sort of a recovery as people try to salvage what they can. I understand there's a problem with water and power. What can you tell us about that? Yes, yeah, so the, there is some water on, but it's it's not very powerful. It's sort of at a trickle, and not every household has uh, that. So that's certainly causing um, you know a, a lot of problems for families, especially. And um, just just in the coastline here, a lot of people are going for swims in the sea. I mean, it's a, it seems to be the only option for a lot of people just to get fresh and clean um, and definitely with the electricity we have seen um, Pete linesmen out and about trying to repair the lines but uh, I fear this could be quite a bit of a process and it will be several days before their re people are reconnected. And is there still a lot of debris blocking the roads stopping these groups from getting getting to hospitals that kind of thing getting help? No, for the most part, um, the roads are pretty clear. There's been a lot of trucks out and, and moving um, 
debris and so forth. And in fact, just just about an hour ago, we were filming on the main road, uh, one of the small side roads, rather, and this group of boys, probably about 10 of them, walked past, all singing and holding a massive piece of roofing iron and that, 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 that had obviously blown off and they were walking it back to where it should go. So everyone's sort of pitching in and trying to, to, to move things as they can, especially debris, um, because one thing you've got to remember is that there was quite a big dengue epidemic Pandemic here, um, and and there still was around 50, over 50 people have had it in recent times, and one person has died. So it's important that a debris does get clear, and, and that it doesn't become a mosquito breeding ground. How much of that is a worry, though, that that the dengue fever could spread if they don't clear these areas quickly enough? Oh, look, definitely. It is a big worry because while the cyclone and the, the high winds sort of cleared away the mosquitoes, there's very few around, but these, breed, these breeding grounds um, can develop really quickly. And if you've got stagnant water, which you do have in, a, a lot of, in front of a lot of the homes that we've been to, that, that's an issue, a big issue. And also when you've got, um, you don't have fresh drinking water and, um, uh, you know, fresh water... You, and, and for washing and other things like that, that's also, you can get all sorts of diseases and that's something authorities are very much aware of and they're hoping that water supply gets on as quickly as possible. And Barbara, is there enough aid coming into the country? I think New Zealand sent uh, a plane full last night, likewise Australia. Yes, that's right. Um, you know, they've unloaded a lot of the, the, the aid and uh, certainly the New Zealand Defence Force and um, Australians have been out and about doing mostly reconnaissance at this stage and get, walking, meeting with local authorities so that they can work out the priorities. Where should the aid go first? Um, while New Zealand and Australia are driving it, obviously they're working with local authorities. So, yeah, it's. I mean, it's here and... Certainly, groups like the Red Cross are working really hard to um, try and get... They've got pre-positioned supplies out and about around the island already. So they're going to... Yesterday, they visited 100 families. Today, they're going to try and get to 200. But it's. I guess it's one of those things that's just been a little bit slow to get going. And... What do people need the most? Is is it food and water, clothing? What what is it? Um, it's the Red Cross in particular are sending out tarpaulins. They're sending out, um, yeah, tarpaulins, tents, cooking utensils. You know, really practical things like tools. You know, machetes and things like that that people can use to clear debris. Um, a lot of people don't have lost. You know, because there's, there's no electricity, they've lost cooking facilities. So these are practical things. I, I saw one family's face when they got their supplies, and it was just, it was, it was magic. You know, they, these are sort of tools that they've been waiting for. And when do you think life will get back to normal and, and business is up and running again, schools are open, that kind of thing? Oh, look, it's going to be some time, I think. I mean, just looking at some of the schools are very badly damaged and um, just with no electricity, no water, it's going to be some time for schools. Some businesses are open, um, things like, you, can, uh, you know, little stalls on the road. It was really heartening to see this down at the wharf, a, a stall with, and a lady was putting out all her, her little bits and pieces for selling. And so you do have li little stalls and little shops that are open, but um, maybe a few more days before the bigger ones are open. And that was TVNZ's Barbara Drever in Tonga. A young woman who was kidnapped and taken to a quarry in West Auckland told police she would rather have died than carry out the demands of her attacker. The 24-year-old's police DVD interview was played to a closed courtroom at the High Court in Auckland today, where Colin Jack Mitchell is on trial. Mr Mitchell is accused of abducting her from Great North Road in the early hours of the morning last February and driving her 25 kilometres to a quarry outside town, where he beat and tried to sexually violate her. He's denied the charges, and his lawyers say the case is one of mistaken identity. 
Our reporter Edward Gay has been in court and just a warning that the details of this case are disturbing. Good evening, Edward. Uh, the woman was out drinking with friends and her memory of the night is a bit blurred. That's right, and the Crown says she became separated from her friends on this night on Great North Road. Um, she was picked up on Great North Road by a man in a car. She's got no memory of that, but she told the police that uh, the first thing she remembers of the incident is coming around. She felt blood on the side of her head. Uh, her dress was off. She didn't recall how that had happened, and she was lying on her side on, on some gravel. The woman said there was a man standing over her. It was dark, but there was a light coming from behind him, and she could see he was wearing a face mask and holding a bat that she described as a baseball bat or a softball bat. She said the man sounded strange as he began issuing demands. She described it almost robotic, uh, and she begged him not to hurt her and told him that he didn't have to be this kind of person. He made some kind of threat telling her that he was, she was going to get herself killed or something similar. And the woman told the police she knew what he wanted, but she said she'd rather die than let that happen. And the man then hit her in the head with the bat. She described it feeling like a burn and uh, she believes she then blacked out. And the next she knew she was scrambling up a pile of gravel. That's right, and, and at the time, also on the phone to the police, and sh she said she didn't know where she was. She followed a fence line she came, she came across, and uh, she followed that all the way around quite a long distance. Um, we've seen an aerial photograph of the area she covered, and she covered quite a distance. Uh, but all this time, she described that she, she didn't know where her attacker was either, um, and she was trying to tell the police, you know, trying to get the police to come out to her, but she couldn't tell them actually where she was, and she eventually found a building and a street sign, and she was able to relay that information, and the, the police responded. And we've also heard from one of the first officers on the scene. That's right, that's uh, Constable Kelvin Meek, and he described seeing the victim for the first time as looking like someone had actually tipped a, a bucket of blood on her. She was in a bad way with a, a large gash in her head and a split eyebrow. Uh, Constable Meek stayed with her in the ambulance um, and he, he basically had a, a long conversation with her. He was relaying this information back to officers on the ground who were, who were trying to find the crime scene. Uh, when his shift ended though, he actually drove back to the area and he told the court that the victim had given him so much information he was able to sort of piece a few things together and he walked up a gravel track and eventually he found the victim's shoes a, a white and a white face mask. But I guess the, one of the most important pieces of evidence he found w was this black glove and it's that black glove that has been tested by ESR and, uh, for DNA and is a strong match to uh, the accused. Um, and uh, you're there. the uh, trial continues. Uh, the trial continues. Thanks very much. That's our court reporter Edward Gay. Well, Australia's Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce may get to be a, get a st be a stay-at-home dad to the baby he's expected with, expecting with his former staffer Vicky Campion, as he faces a mutiny from some party colleagues who want him out. The MPs believe his credibility as a leader has been irreparably damaged by the relationship and the scandal is an unhelpful distra distraction, as ABC's political reporter Lucy Barber explains. This morning, one of his Nationals MPs, a Queenslander by the name of Ken O'Dowd, threw quite a bombshell by actually declaring publicly that he wanted this issue sorted out by the end of the week and that he thought there were other people in the party who would be good future leaders. So that really added fuel to the fire. But then other MPs in the National Party came out in support of Barnaby Joyce saying that they backed him 100% and if there wasn't anything incriminating against him in terms of entitlement scandals or anything like that, then what's the big deal? Uh, everyone should just move on and let him have time to, to get through this. Since then, uh, more and more of the Nationals MPs and Senators we're talking to are uh, tending to go to ground and not want to discuss this publicly or privately, but a growing number are coming to the conclusion that they think Barnaby Joyce should be given a bit more time to prove he is capable of leading the party and uh, the, whether he does go on to do that depends on if another scandal emerges.
messages that they don't approve of or whether this just continues to suck political oxygen out of the coalition and it just gets to a point where it's all too much. So at this stage, does he have the support to survive? At this stage, he does. And I would also say that we're talking about a man here who is, um, someone put it to me yesterday, a Nationals MP, that this guy would survive in the desert without water for days. Uh, he has long been a maverick uh, from when he was a Queensland senator. He was always an agitator, always standing up for exactly what he believed in, uh, didn't necessarily um, hold back in any of his views ever, was an, always a controversial, outspoken figure. And when he became Deputy Prime Minister, that was the big question. Is this guy equipped to ably and steadily lead uh, a party? And one of the big uh, key assets for Barnaby Joyce has been the fact that he is a mover and shaker. He's an authentic kind of guy. Uh, most Australians know him as Barnaby rather than Barnaby Joyce. He's a household name and he comes across as being very real. Uh, he is quite likeable. He's a larrikin. And so that uh, a lot of people in his party look at him and think, well, if we toss him as the leader, we lose that brand. And that brand is really important for us as a party, especially as the junior coalition uh, coalition um, arm, if you're, if you're sort of negotiating money for rural policy and rural projects out in the bush. Uh, Barnaby Joyce does have a lot of sway when in terms of things like just getting cash for projects. So he is important to them. I read one commentator today saying that he's lost moral authority among his mm. national colleagues. Oh, absolutely. They are deeply uncomfortable with this situation. And uh, colleagues who've known about it for a long time have long been uncomfortable with it and wondering and waiting to see how it would all unfold. And their worst fears have, of course, been realised. And that's the ABC's Lucy Barber. <laughs> It is 29 minutes to six. Coming up, Associate Education Minister Calvin Davis comes under fire after an Auckland charter school claims he showed favouritism towards a charter school in his own electorate. The ongoing saga over where to build an America's Cup village and Australia's Conservative National Party is in crisis with its leader Barnaby Joyce facing a mutiny from MPs who want him out. Don't forget, we'd love your feedback. You can text us on 2101 and you can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ. Facebook us at Checkpoint with John Campbell or email checkpoint at radionz.co.nz. But first, here's Anna Thomas with the headlines. Three senior National Party MPs have put their hats in the ring today in a bid to become opposition leader. Simon Bridges and Judith Collins had put their names forward by lunchtime and this afternoon they were joined by Amy Adams. Meanwhile, MP Stephen Joyce says he's canvassing caucus support before deciding whether or not to seek the party leadership. Authorities in Tonga say they are struggling to come to terms with the extent of the damage wrought in the kingdom by Cyclone Gita. New Zealand's acting High Commissioner to Tonga, Elena Prokuta, says a ca gathering information is difficult as power and phone lines have been knocked out by the cyclone. Meanwhile, villages on Fiji's remote southern islands are facing a big clean-up after the cyclone destroyed a number of homes and devastated crops and plantations. The police in Nelson have today charged two people with the murder of Stoke woman Tracy Ann Harris. The 43-year-old was found dead at her home in Stoke almost exactly two years ago. A 30-year-old woman has been arrested in Rotorua and a 26-year-old man has been arrested in Christchurch. Investors have reacted badly to Fletcher Building, forecasting even heavier losses in its construction arm. Shares in the troubled construction and building products company have slumped today, closing down 73 cents or 9.4 per cent at $7.04. The chief executive, Ross Taylor, is promising the company will finish all outstanding projects. Fletcher's stock has fallen 35 per cent in the past year. Nearly seven years on from the 2011 Christchurch earthquake, some residents have launched a campaign 
protesting the thousands of unresolved insurance and earthquake commission claims. Campaign organisers say the Prime Minister has vowed to settle remaining earthquake claims quickly and cheaply, but she says affected homeowners haven't heard much from the new government. And those are the headlines. Kia ora, and uh, turning to business now with Giles Beckwood, our business editor. So Giles, all eyes on Fletcher Building today. Indeed, Go. Good evening to you, Cheryl. Yes, there is no other story in town. It is the Valentine's Day massacre of the company sector. Uh, and quite basically, it is, it's worse than I think most people had feared. Some thought that there might be another two, three hundred million dollars worth of bad debts and losses out there. But to come in with six hundred and sixty million has just bowled over most people. The fact is, though, of course, that the strength, the size of Fletcher Building is probably what saved it. A lesser company would have gone to the wall with these sorts of losses. But the sheer size and scope and breadth of the Fletcher building, the residential side, the fact it's got quarries, it does roads, it builds houses, it makes steel, it does formica and laminates, uh, a whole pile of building products, placemakers chain. That's what saved it. That's what's made the bankers uh, willing to stand by it, uh, to forgive it, the breaches of those banking agreements uh, that they have in place, um, although they may be pretty hard-nosed as they renegotiate those, which they're hoping to do by the end of next month. This is not the end of it, although Mr. Taylor, Ross Taylor, the chief executive, is uh, confident that they found all the bad news, but this will reverberate through the company for quite some time, uh, and it will show its way through, for instance, probably higher debt servicing costs, uh, more stringent lending conditions from those banks and other lenders. Uh, it well, may well be that the company, as it looks at its business, decides that in the end it probably doesn't need some parts of it, so we may see some asset sales, although they've sort of tried to rule that out so far. Uh, and following on from that, of course, for shareholders, they've missed out on the interim dividend that would have been declared next week at the half-year announcement. And there's a good prospect that, in fact, that the company may want to save cash uh, and therefore it won't pay, uh, pay out a full-year dividend in August. We'll have to wait, on see, wait and see on that one. Quite clearly, there is a damage to the Fletcher Building reputation and its decision to not pursue any more big project work. Uh, they are a vertical construction company, which means that they do everything from go to woe, from top to bottom, and that's been its problem. Uh, its decision not to pursue any more work in that area may have ramifications for the building sector in this country. It may mean that if they're out of the picture, the pressure will fall on lesser companies, or we may see some new foreign companies come into the market to try and snap up uh, work there, but inevitably it is likely to lead to higher building costs on projects uh, and that will have ramifications flowing through the system. So lots of things to go under the bridge, lots of ramifications still to be felt and, and I think that we'll be talking about Fletcher Building uh, and the trouble it's had today for quite some time to come. And Giles, its share price took a, quite a hammering today, didn't it? And did that have an overall effect on the market? Oh, it, it, it just slammed the market. Uh, I mean, there's close to $98 million worth of Fletcher, Challenge, Fletcher Building shares have changed hands today. Uh, just a slight amendment, some late trading that went through has meant that the final uh, price fall was $0.72 cents, uh, at $7.05. Now, the turnover, as I say, $98 million for the day. That meant that the top 50 index fell by 63 points. That's about 0.8% to 8,059. Uh, and that was about half the share market's turnover. But um, uh, on that point of view, you know, I mean, the Fletcher Challenge, oh, sorry, I keep saying Fletcher Challenge, that shows you how long I've been around. The Fletcher Building shares uh, are actually back at levels they were a couple of years ago. And it's been a continuing story where they've been warning people of losses and bad news to come and, and unfortunately delivering on them from that point of view. So the market has been hurt, um, but it will recover. It will bounce back.
And looking at the currency, we'll just say, Sharon, uh, some a survey of inflation expectations, they perked up a little bit. So that just buoyed expectations that perhaps rate rises will be coming from the Reserve Bank at some stage next year with the Kiwi ending the day at 73.2 US cents and 92.8 Australian. Giles Beckford, thank you very much for your time. Let's go to the weather now with Met Service meteorologist John Law. Kia ora, John. Kia ora. Well, after that uh, rather showery few days we've had, it is looking like a much brighter day as we head through in towards Thursday. Plenty of sunshine for the likes of Auckland and those temperatures up to around about 27 degrees Celsius once again. And in fact, for most of the North Island, there's plenty of fine weather. A bit of morning cloud here and there, but with plenty of afternoon sunshine, we'll find temperatures climbing again. Not nearly as warm through the night time, so starting points for likes of Hamilton, around about 13, and highs back to around about 27 degrees Celsius. It's a fine looking day down in Wellington as well, a bit of morning cloud, but some brighter skies that's through the afternoon. Top temperatures in the capital back to around about 23 degrees Celsius. But some of the best sunshine will be on the eastern coast for the likes of uh, Wairapa, with highs in Marston of 28 degrees Celsius, and many spots staying fine and dry throughout the daytime. Down south, we'll have a bit more cloud around the Canterbury coast first thing, perhaps a few spots of drizzle, but it should brighten up for the afternoon. And temperatures climbing once more to 27 degrees Celsius for Christchurch, and we are going to find a bit more cloud arriving as we head through and towards the afternoon. For the western coast of the South Island, a cloud and rain runs up from the south. A bit of a wetter end today for the likes of Westland and Buller, and a few showers as well down in the far south for the likes of Invercargill and Dunedin, and temperatures are a little bit cooler with highs in Invercargill of 21 degrees Celsius. And that's it from me. Thanks, John. An Auckland charter school is accusing the Associate Education Minister Calvin Davis of favouritism over his close ties with a trust that runs a charter school in his electorate. Eleven charter schools are currently in negotiations with the Ministry of Education to change to a different teaching model. And Mr Davis has been, in his own words, working closely with the He Puna Marama Trust, which runs a charter school in Whangarei. But the Villa Education Trust, which runs charter schools in Auckland, says the Education Minister Chris Hipkins won't speak with them and it's accusing the Associate Education Minister of playing favourites. Earlier this afternoon I asked Mr Davis what he thinks of the complaint. Oh, I think that's a bit silly. I've got, uh, I visit a lot of schools in my electorate. Um, I do know the um, CEO of Hipuna Marama Trust. Uh, they contacted me, the trust contacted me concerned about the scaremongering uh, that's been going on from the National and ACT MPs and uh, I basically uh, on the phone talked them through the uh, information that the Minister of Education had publicly released last week just explaining the process and the options. What sort of assurances have you given that school? Uh, what, what do you mean assurances? In terms of their future, I mean you say that there's been some scaremongering but what have you told this school that you've got the connection with? Oh look, I've, like I say, I've just talked them through the process and um, the options available and uh, we're hopeful that we'll, we'll be able to sort it out but uh, I'm not involved in any negotiations. You're not involved That's in any... The... Sorry? Yeah, no, I'm not involved in negotiations. That's not my delegation. But I, as the local member of parliament, they got in touch with me. I spoke to them um, and tried to uh, soothe their concerns, like I say, because of the scaremongering and um, muckraking of the uh, National and ACT parties. But can you see where Alwyn Paul from Villa Education Trust is coming from? I mean, he's saying that he's, they have tried to talk to the Education Minister, Chris Hipkins. They can't have any sort of talks with him because they're, they're being told that this is in process at the moment and that ministry officials are dealing with it and yet you've been speaking to a school in your electorate and giving them assurances that everything will be all right. Sorry I didn't give them assurances but I, I have said that we'll try and work through this. Look I also tried to contact um, a person I know in the Te Reo unit at the Villa uh, Trust but couldn't get in touch with him. Uh, you know, so I've made attempts, but like I, I, they, I haven't received any direct correspondence from them asking to talk. I'm happy to talk to them too, uh, and to talk them through that same document, talk them through the process and and um, and the options that are available to them. Uh, I'd treat them in no different than I've uh, treated anyone else. But the um, Puna Marama Trust got in touch with me uh, last week. But Raywin Tipani from Hipuna Marama 
has told RNZ that she feels more assured about the future of the school after speaking with you. She says, I think Calvin's very, very keen to reduce the angst that's occurring and get us all to the table and work through it. So they are feeling assured. And yet this other school that is not in your electorate is obviously obviously still has concerns that it's that are not being addressed and that they can't speak to any minister. Well, absolutely um, uh, keen to reduce the angst. That's exactly the point of talking to people. And like I say, I'm happy to talk to um, the Villa Trust as well and have the same sort of conversation, talking them through the paper and through the options uh, and to... Um, you know, to, to see um, what we can do. Hopefully that uh, they'll engage, though, in good faith as well with the Ministry of Education. I believe the Ministry of Education was in touch with them yesterday. Um, uh, you know, so um, I think that this is all just part of the uh, anxiety that the National and ECT Party have uh, caused and created the confusion. Um, it, quite literally, as I said in the House today, they're running around uh, doing their best ch chicken little impersonations, telling these schools that the sky's going to come falling down on their heads, and it's not. There's no c conflict of interest then, as you see it? What, why would there be a conflict of interest? Because you're a minister who's speaking to a, school, a charter school about its future, and yet a school outside your electorate can't get a meeting with a minister about its future. Uh, they contacted me as their local member of parliament and I spoke, talked them through information that is publicly available. And I think the Villa Trust actually is in my electorate. Um, I've got no problems with being in touch with them and talking them through that paper just like I did with Hepuna Marama Trust. Are these schools going to close? Uh, sorry, and like I said, like I said, Sharon, uh, I tried uh, the other other day to uh, ring somebody that I know in their uh, Te Reo unit. Uh, you know, I couldn't get in touch with uh, him. Hopefully Did we'll, you try we'll to speak to, to Alwyn Paul? I don't have Alwyn's number. I, I could try and um, uh, talk to him, but but the, you know they've they've also saying that um, that we're not responding to any communications. I I haven't had any um, to my uh, my knowledge. I haven't had any direct communication from them. So you'd be willing to take a call from Alwyn Paul from from Villa Education Trust? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and give him uh, assurances. But, no, look, like I said, I haven't given anyone assurances, but I will talk him through the paper. Whether he wants to hear what I've got to say, um, that's another thing. Are these schools safe? Do they, are they going to close? Look, the model is what is um, going to go. The schools don't have to. There's nothing. Uh, to the, the differences between the uh, charter schools and um, the uh, designated character schools are purely administrative. So, you know, it's around governance, it's around property, and it's around teacher registration. And that's spelled out in the um, document that the Minister publicly released. Uh, there's nothing to say that they have to stop teaching the way they're teaching and stop teaching what they're teaching. And it's just part of the misinformation that the national government, uh, sorry, the national opposition and the uh, ACT opposition are, are propagating. Have you had a conversation with the Prime Minister today about this, about the letter? Uh, no, she asked me. We haven't had a conversation. She leaned over in the house and just said, "Was I aware of the, of the letter?" And I said, "Yes." And that was the end of it. Yeah, because to be honest, I I don't see um, that there's much of an issue with um, the letter. You know, they're upset. I think that they're upset because they're confused. And that's the Associate Education Minister, Calvin Davis. The Ministry of Education wouldn't say what actions, if any, are being taken, but said it will respond to Villa Trust shortly. Growing waiting times for a key diagnostic procedure contributed to a delay in rolling out national bowel cancer screening. Health officials briefed MPs at Parliament today about progress with screening for the disease, which claims around 1,200 lives every year. It follows the revelation yesterday that a botch up with addresses in a pilot screening program meant 2,500 Waitamata residents failed to be invited to be screened. Three patients were diagnosed with bowel cancer and one person has since died. Health correspondent Karen Brown was at the Health Select Committee today and filed this report.
The address bungle wasn't raised at the committee, but long-awaited and contentious bowel screening was. Just three district health boards, including Waitemata, are screening 60 to 74-year-olds for bowel cancer, with the ministry announcing last month that the staged rollout for the remaining 17 will take longer than originally planned. Nationals Health spokesperson Jonathan Coleman demanded to know what was behind the delay. The ministry's director of service commissioning, Jill Lane, replied it was business as usual for a complex programme. Information did change. It started off with the uh, what we, we knew about Waikato District Health Board and their capability and pressures that they were facing across the District Health Board. Then it moved into some pressures that the Northland District Health Board were having, particularly around their blood service. Waiting times for patients needing a colonoscopy procedure were also growing. Our expectation of those wait times being able to be managed within a certain level, they were blowing out. Those three elements, we put that together and looked at the DHBs that were being rolled out for the last part of the year and our assessment of that was that we needed to do more work to reduce those colonoscopy wait times. Officials told MPs colonoscopy wait times are one of five factors they assess before any DHB is given the go-ahead to commence screening. The ministry's clinical head of screening, Jane O'Hallahan, said cautions needed because the safety of patients is at stake. We can't compromise safety, so we do do a check just before we start an each DHB to make sure that they are able to safely deliver this programme. Latest data isn't readily available on colonoscopy waiting times at individual DHBs and the Ministry declined to release it today. However, RNZ reported in 2014 that 39,500 colonoscopies were needed in 2013 to check for symptoms of bowel cancer, but just 30,000 were able to be provided at public hospitals. In August 2016, 3,850 patients got a colonoscopy, 45% more than the previous year. Speaking outside the committee, Ms Lane said patient safety was vital to the successful national rollout. We are now working with each individual district health board to really understand what the pressures are there, what the issues are, so that we can be on track to continue the rollout of the programme and have it um, fully in place by June 2021. Heading the Ministry delegation was the Acting Director-General Stephen McKernan in his sixth day in the role following the resignation of the former CE, Chai Chua. Mr McKernan told MPs more DHBs are in deficit than three years ago and it's deeply worrying. If we go back to 13 years, 13, 14, there were about a third of the um, country's DHBs in deficits and as I said, um, we were up around 16 at this time. So. Um, that's, that's concerning and, and so we need to look and think about how we're going to address some of that. Pushed for his top three priorities, he listed primary care, mental health and new priorities for DHB annual plans. Mō te hotaka o te ahi ahi, ko Karen Brown tēnei. Now, if you're on a waiting list for a colonoscopy anywhere in the country, we'd love to hear from you. You can text us on 2101. You can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ, Facebook us Checkpoint with John Campbell or email checkpoint at radionz.co.nz. The saga about where to build an America's Cup village in Auckland is getting murkier with costs rising and the government and council appearing to be at odds with Team New Zealand. The government and Auckland Council have announced they might go ahead with a design different to the one already in the planning process. It would use land on Wynyard Point for some bases, making a smaller extension to Halsey Street Wharf and perhaps save between 50 and 30 million dollars. But it doesn't seem that simple, as our Auckland correspondent Todd Nile reports. The deal seemed done in December when Auckland Council opted for a $128 million extension of Halsey Street and Hobbs and Wharves in the CBD. The Minister for Economic Development, David Parker, favoured another plan and has succeeded in getting fuel storage company Stolthaven to move off Wynyard Point 200 metres away. That allows a wider spread of bases and smaller wharf extensions. But who's on board so far? David Parker. Uh, we've yet to reach final agreements with either the Council or uh, Emirates Team New Zealand, um, but uh, certainly this is progress. 
Auckland's Mayor Phil Goff says there's two on board. Well, there's one option from government and council combined, which is a hybrid option. So when you say combined, so if it was up to the government and the council, you've agreed that this is the way to go? This, this is the option that we would put forward to amend the resource consent to take it into account. It's clear, though, that Team New Zealand is not on board. No interviews, but a straight-talking statement in which its chief executive, Grant Dalton, says he's surprised at the release of the plan at this stage and it put forward new ideas yesterday. The team wants a more concentrated location of bases to create more of a village feel. The Mayor, Phil Goff, has always said that regardless of which plan was approved, it had to work for Team New Zealand. This is how Mr Goff explained that today. It, it has to work for what they need. It won't always be what they want. Uh, and, you know, they have some bottom lines, but we have some bottom lines too. The latest cost estimates, $185 million for the government option, perhaps $200 million for the plan already in motion. The clock is ticking for this to be resolved. The current council plan continues through the planning process, with approval hoped for by August. The bases are wanted by late next year. Neither Mr Goff nor Mr Parker will say how much longer talks would go on, with the Minister saying that was up to Team New Zealand. Itamaki Makoro, Mote Hotaka, Ote Ahiahi, Ko Todd Nile Tene. For all the romantics out there, today is Valentine's Day. And in Australia this year, the date has even more significance. It's the first Valentine's Day since same sex marriage was legalised in December. 400 couples have married since then, and today hundreds of weddings have been booked in, including one in Sydney where the couple have waited more than four decades to tie the knot. The BBC's Hal Griffiths went along. Coming together in the eyes of the law at last. After four decades, Brian and Link say they've always felt like a married couple, but the law has never allowed them that privilege until now. Our family and friends have been very good and have essentially accepted us all the way through, but to have it legal and knowing that society also acknowledges the relationship is, is special. They became a couple a week after they first met in 1974, when homosexuality was still illegal across Australia. It took more than two decades for it to be decriminalised in every state. But the hardest battle for Brian and Link was persuading people that a gay couple could be in a long, lasting, loving relationship. I will love you forever, more especially if you keep providing that magic and healing food that has nourished me over the years. <laughs> when life is so fragile, what else can you do but to offer love? Their wedding was planned in just a month. Once the new same-sex marriage law was introduced, they saw no reason to wait. By the legal authority vested in me by the Commonwealth of Australia, I can declare that after 44 years, you are finally husband and husband. Congratulations! I think it's good, and I think the fact that uh, the country's recognised that yes. this happens and it's normal, and yeah. apart from the marriage thing, it, I think it's a recognisation in accepting. It's, yeah. a, to me, the biggest thing. And, you know, the country overwhelmingly voted to do it. The ceremony finished with an unofficial blessing. Many faith groups still oppose same-sex marriage in Australia. Churches can, under the new law, refuse to host a wedding. In the last month, around 400 same-sex couples have married under the new law. Both in their 70s, Link and Brian are amongst the oldest, so far at least. 55 years together you might do this too? 55 years, yeah, maybe. I'll think about it. Who knows? <laughs> take your time, there's no rush. Link and Brian have hardly rushed into marriage, but it's taken decades for Australia to finally catch up with them. Now we can say, my husband, wherever we go, my husband I never I. regret. <laughs> And that was the newly married Sydney couple Brian and Link ending that report from Health Griffiths. <laughs>
Coming up after six o'clock, Simon Bridges, Judith Collins and Amy Adams all put their hands up for the National Party leadership today, but I don't think that's the end of it. Our Deputy Political Editor Chris Bramwell joins us live. Plus a billion dollar blowout for Fletcher Building, the company's share price drops as it puts a halt on new jobs. We'll hear from outgoing Chairman Ralph Norris. And there's growing concern that poor and middle income families will miss out as more schools ask children to bring computers to class. Also after six o'clock, we'll have more on the story about Barnaby Joyce, Australia's Conservative National Party's in crisis. He's the leader of the party and he's facing a mutiny from some MPs and senators who want him out. That's over the relationship with a former staffer who's now pregnant with their child. Others say he's done nothing wrong and insist his position is, stay, is safe. So we'll have more on that from Canberra. Uh, don't forget you can text us on 2101. You can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ, Facebook us Checkpoint with John Campbell or email checkpoint at radionz.co.nz and you can watch us online at Facebook Live at rnz.co.nz slash checkpoint on Freeview Channel 50 and on Face TV Sky Channel 83. Coming up also after the news with Anna Thomas at six o'clock, we'll be looking at uh, the firearm threat. Uh, the police union says the number of officers being threatened with guns has increased by almost 40% in two years. It says criminals know how to exploit this current system which licenses the owner, not the weapon. RNZ News at five o'clock, uh, rather six o'clock. Good evening, I'm Anna Thomas. The Health Minister says thousands of mental health and addiction workers are to receive the pay they deserve. David Clark says the government has agreed to negotiate an extension to the care and support pay equity settlement to people working in mental health and addiction. The settlement came into force last year, giving aged and disability care and support workers a pay rise of between 15 and 50%. Negotiations will now begin on a claim that mental health workers should get the same increases. David Clark says equal pay is long overdue. They have one of the most challenging jobs out there, working with mental health and addiction sufferers. They are doing the work that is at the coalface and that makes a real difference in our society. The settlement with the previous workforce was negotiated in a reasonable way and we think they deserve to be paid adequately for their work. David Clark says the government has an estimate of the cost, but more will be revealed in this year's budget. Flanked by four of her colleagues, Amy Adams has entered the race to become the next National Party leader, joining Simon Bridges and Judith Collins as confirmed contenders. Standing beside her as she announced her bid in Parliament's grounds this afternoon were Nikki Kay, Chris Bishop, Maggie Barry and Tim McIndoe who thus become the first MPs to signal who they're supporting. Ms Adams says her point of difference from the other candidates is that she offers a mix of urban and rural. I've had 16 years practising as a lawyer, working in, in the commercial sector, running businesses, and I think that blend of urban and rural is a rare and unique capability that I bring to the job. But I'd also say that in my six years as Cabinet Minister, I've held 10 portfolios, some very complex and, and difficult portfolios. Amy Adams says she could work with Paula Bennett, who is seeking re-election as deputy leader. A hui that's begun in Wellington has agreed that the upcoming Royal Commission on Abuse and State Care should be extended to look at more recent cases. The government's proposing it cover only the years from 1950 to 1999. Lawyer Sonia Cooper, who represents many of those who were abused, says the consensus at the hui is that it should extend into the 2000s. The hui is also discussing whether the inquiry should be extended to cover religious institutions, including the Catholic Church. A euthanasia advocate on trial in the High Court in Wellington referred to another contented customer after reading the death notice of an associate who also belonged to the group Exit International. Susan Austin is accused of assisting the suicide of Anne-Marie Treadwell in 2016 and illegally importing controlled drugs. A police constable, Lewis Garland, read to the court emails taken from Ms Austin's computer, including one she sent to Exit International in August 2015.
I'm just back from doing a workshop in Napier and have a few members for you, plus renewals. All good stuff. And can you please remove Diane Nicol from your membership list? I see her death notice in the paper today. Another contented customer. Heck, am I allowed to say that? She is, Susie. Constable Lewis Garland. In another email, Ms Austin asked one of her suppliers to disguise the bottles of drugs he was sending her. The Defence Force says while the damage caused by Cyclone Gita in Tonga is significant, it's not as bad as feared. An Air Force Orion did a survey flight over the main island of Tongatapu and the island of Ewa uh, yesterday afternoon and a Hercules arrived with aid supplies last night. The acting commander of Joint Forces, Kevin McAvoy, says the survey has enabled them to pinpoint exactly where help needs to go. The damage, um, you know, is things like roofs blowing off. Uh, we've got pictures of the port area, uh, the airport, uh, solar farm and critical infrastructure like hospitals and medical facilities. Kevin McAvoy says photos taken on the survey flight have been sent to the Tongan authorities as they work out which areas are in most need of aid. Another flight with aid supplies will arrive tomorrow. Greenpeace is pouring scorn on a pledge by Genesis Energy to end coal-fired electricity generation by 2025 under most circumstances and by 2030 without exception. Its climate change, rather, its climate campaigner Amanda Larson says the possibility of burning coal for another 12 years shows the company is out of touch. She says the fact that one of New Zealand's largest electricity generators is celebrating this plan as a positive step forward for the climate is farcical and misleading. Ms Larson says Britain, which has nearly 30 times the scale of New Zealand's coal-fired infrastructure, has committed to closing all its coal-fired power stations by 2025. It's at five past six. New Zealand boxer Joseph Parker won't be sparring with former champion Tyson Fury before his world title unification bout with Englishman Anthony Joshua next month. Fury, who's the previous holder of Parker's WBO belt and Joshua's WBA and IBF titles, has offered to help Parker prepare for the bout in Cardiff. While Parker and Fury have developed a friendship over the past few months, Parker's trainer Kevin Barry told Sky Sport UK that wouldn't mean getting into the ring together. Tyson put his hand up to help us in the last two weeks once we arrived in London and really with uh, two weeks out you know we don't need to be getting in the ring with a six foot nine Tyson Fury but you know Tyson's a great friend of our team and uh, you know we appreciate all the support he gives us but it just uh, that that doesn't work out for us. Kevin Barry. The Olympic debut of 16-year-old New Zealand skier Alice Robinson has been delayed yet again with high winds forcing the postponement of the slalom at the Games in Pyeongchang. The event will now be held on Friday. Robinson was due to compete in the giant slalom on Monday but high winds forced the postponement of that event until tomorrow. Rugby League State of Origin will head to Adelaide for the first time. It'll be the third consecutive series in which a game will be played outside New South Wales and Queensland after matches were previously allocated to Melbourne for this year and Perth in 2019. And that's the news. The fight to lead the National Party begins. The big thing they have to think about is do you go with the new generation or do you go for a really a bit of an opposite? Judith Collins moves first. This is going to be the fight of our lives for 2020 and I'm the person to do it. While Bill English looks forward to a life outside politics. I have had one offer from a pizza company who want me to help them launch their spaghetti pizza. Which I'm not going to do unless they put pineapple on it as well. Uh, whatever you're topping, Guy and Aspiner and Susie Ferguson, Morning Report, weekdays from 6. Then on 9 to noon, what a new study of more than 200 practising rural midwives says about the challenges they face. And after 10, the smooth, soulful sounds of Northland singer-songwriter Tex. Join me, Catherine Ryan, on 9 to noon after Morning Report on RNZ National. And now the Met Service is short forecast until midnight tomorrow for Northland to Taumaranui and Taihape. Also Coromandel Peninsula, Bay of Plenty, Taupo and Hawke's Bay. Rain becoming widespread this afternoon with localised downpours and thunderstorms all e easing this evening and becoming mostly fine tomorrow morning. For Gisborne, showers clearing and becoming fine tomorrow. Taranaki to Wellington also widened up a cloud and isolated showers, clearing from most places tomorrow morning. 
Nelson and Marlborough, mainly fine, isolated showers about the ranges this evening. Buller, Westland and Fiordland, remaining showers clearing and becoming fine. However, a period of rain spreading north tomorrow, briefly heavy in Fiordland. For Canterbury, areas of cloud and drizzle clearing tomorrow morning and becoming fine. Otago and Southland, mainly fine inland today. A few showers elsewhere becoming confined to coastal Otago this evening. A brief rain everywhere tomorrow. And for the Chatham Islands, low cloud or fog and occasional drizzle. RNZ National, it is eight minutes past six and you're listening to Checkpoint with Sharon Brett Kelly. Kia ora Anna, and they're off. Three candidates threw their hat into the ring for the National Party leadership today, wasting no time in making their pitches as to why they should be the ones to replace Bill English. Mr English, of course, is to step down from the top job in just under two weeks' time and leave Parliament. So how's the battle to replace him shaping up? Our Deputy Political Editor Chris Bramwell joins us this evening from the Parliamentary Office. Good afternoon, Chris. Good evening, Sharon. The candidates didn't waste any time in declaring their hands today, did they? No, they didn't at all. And part of that, the reason really, is that there's only two weeks in this race. So Bill English, as you said yesterday, announced that he was going to resign as leader and then also bow out from politics and parliament altogether. Now, that only allows two weeks. He said February the 27th at their National Party caucus meeting on a Tuesday. He will then formally resign. And at that point, he expected the new leadership team to be in place. So yesterday, all the... MPs and former ministers said, look, today's Bill English's day. So there was no discussion about who was going to put their name forward then. But first thing this morning, bang, not long after 8am, Judith Collins put out a tweet saying that she was first. She was going to be uh, throwing her hat into the ring. 11 o'clock, Simon Bridges, how to stand up out on the bridge here at Parliament. And then Amy Adams at 3.30. They're all well aware that they only have two weeks in order to win the support of their colleagues to take the National Party leadership. And how is each one of them pitching themselves? I mean, they're, they're, because they're all pretty different personalities, aren't they? They are. So Judith Collins says that what she brings or would bring to a National Party leadership is that she is strong and decisive. She says she has a lot of experience in opposition and also that she is the one that can hold the government to account. She's talking a lot about 2020 and how that, that she will take the fight to the Labour-led government then and she thinks that she can get... Uh, 61 seats for National and Parliament and that she's the one to do it. So she's really fight talking some fighting talk. Simon Bridges talks about generational change. He also has experience. All three of them have been Cabinet Ministers, so they have that Cabinet and Government experience. He talks about generational change. He's 41 years old and he said that he also wants to... Um, he talked about renewing and renewal, so new people, but also he talked about having some new policies. He didn't, of course, outline what they were, but he's a lot of talk there about change. Amy Adams, she said that her point of difference really is about having an urban and rural mix, and she would bring that to the leadership. So she uh, was formerly a commercial lawyer for 16 years. She was born and uh, spent about half her life living in Auckland. She then married a sheep farmer, and she's a Selwyn MP, so she has that rural background as well. She also, as I said, was a former cabinet minister with some quite high profile positions and she says she had 10 different portfolios so she talked a lot about that experience as well. So they all have slightly different experience and strengths that they're bringing to the positions. Something that they do all talk about though is regardless of who wins that they want to present a united caucus. And so Amy Adams said she talked to Judith Collins and Simon Bridges before and they've all talked about that, about how they have to be unified through this process and beyond. It was interesting today that Amy Adams turned up with, surrounded by quite a few other MPs, quite a different tack to what the other two did today. Yes, that's right. So Judith Collins obviously announced on Twitter, as I said, and Simon Bridges was by himself on the tiles at Parliament. Uh, Amy Adams arrived at a press conference that she held outside by the Rose Garden, which is a very nice setting, uh, and she turned up with Nikki Kay, Maggie Barry, Chris Bishop and Tim McIndoe with her, uh, which was quite interesting. And now they all represent different parts of the party. Um, Nikki Kay and Chris Bishop, I would say, are probably quite socially liberal, that side of the party. Um, Tim McIndoe is certainly more conservative. So there were different strengths from even the people that were with her. And another part of that as well is that Tim McIndoe is the former senior 
whip. So he has really good contacts throughout the caucus and he knows everyone. So I think it was very interesting that she had those four there and also the fact that they were prepared to come out publicly immediately and put their support behind Amy Adams. And what about what about others who haven't yet declared their hand? Because there seems to be a few other possibilities. That's right. So Stephen Joyce said today that he is taking some soundings. He pretty much said that if people want him to go for the leadership, then he will consider it. Jonathan Coleman also is not ruling it in or out. He said he was going to sit back and wait and see what happened. Now, he was saying that before Simon Bridges and Amy Adams had announced that they would be going for the leadership. Uh, the other is Mark Mitchell, who is a third-term MP. He doesn't perhaps have as high a profile as the others, but he also said that he was considering a tilt at the leadership, but not making any decisions at the moment. That, too, was said before uh, Amy Adams and Simon Bridges put their hat in. So now that there are three uh, quite senior faces running for the leadership, it's not really clear whether those others will still be considering a tilt at it because three people running is quite a few. If you have more than that, I guess it can start to get a little bit messy. So we'll just have to wait and see. We also, the other person to mention is Paula Bennett, who has confirmed that she would like to remain the deputy leader of National. Um, Amy Adams, uh, when we asked her about that, said that she uh, really likes Paula and she would be happy for her to stay on as deputy. But of course, that is a decision for the caucus. So the caucus votes on the leadership and the deputy. They don't decide on who their running mate's going to be. But um, but Paula Bennett still clearly wants that job. Chris, thanks very much for that. That's our Deputy Political Editor, Chris Bramwell. Well, shares in Fletcher Building tumbled 9% today after the company forecast more losses in its construction division and announced its chair would stand down. The company revealed it would make a $660 million loss in its buildings and interiors division this year, half a billion more than it forecast in October. The building products and construction firm also told investors there'll be no half-year dividend and its chair, Sir Ralph Norris, will stand down. Sir Ralph says the size of the losses have been disappointing and surprising considering the company's roots. Look, if you go back and look at this business, I mean, the construction business was virtually the foundation of Fletcher's going back over 100 years ago. And one would have thought that that was a part of the business that we would have um, had significant strength and obviously process and all the rest of it over built up over a hundred years. Um, it's disappointing to find that this business was not as robust as we had, as as, a, as the board thought. And you know we thought we had major issues with a number of our other businesses that we really concentrated on. So to some extent we were somewhat blindsided what, by, by what happened at BNI. But you're right, BNI is a, a business that has um, high revenues, low margins, and from a profitability perspective, it's not worth the risk. Sir Ralph Norris says he will be helping the company transition through a number of changes over the next few months, with three new directors and a strategy to put back on track. Its chief executive, Ross Taylor, says the company won't be taking on any more projects for the building and interiors business and will get out of that area altogether once all 16 projects on its books are completed. Those projects include the Auckland Convention Centre and the Commercial Bay development on the Auckland waterfront. Mr Taylor says he's confident the division's losses have now been totally accounted for. It's worse than I was expecting. Coming into the role, um, it was always wide open and I mean I was attracted by all the great things about Fletcher's but I knew there was going to be um, some focus on the building and interiors provisions um, and I expected to get in there and possibly it might be a bit worse. I hadn't quite expected the breadth of it across the entire building, such a large project portfolio, I thought it might be more focused. So the size and breadth of it in B&I was probably a surprise. Ross Taylor will be delivering the company's first half result next week. America's top spies have issued a stark warning on Russia meddling in US politics. Speaking at a session of the Senate Intelligence Committee, the six heads of US intelligence agencies jointly warned that Russian attempts to interfere in American politics are continuing unabated and pose a threat to the midterm congressional elections in November. With more, here's CNN's Jessica Schneider. 
A unanimous warning from the heads of all six U.S. intelligence agencies. Russia is at it again. Yes, we, we have seen Russian uh, activity and intentions to have an impact on the next election cycle here. I agree with Director Pompeo's assessment about the likelihood of the 2018 uh, occurrence as well. This is not going to change or stop. Yes, it is not going to change, nor is it going to stop. Uh, we have not seen any evidence of any significant change from last year. I agree with Director Pompeo. As do I. The intelligence chiefs also stand by last year's assessment that Russia interfered in the 2016 election. There should be no doubt that Russia perceived that its past efforts has as successful. But despite this, the president has repeatedly called the entire Russia investigation a hoax. For 11 months, they've had this phony cloud over this administration, over our government, and it has hurt our government. It does hurt our government. It's a Democrat hoax. Prompting members of the Senate Intelligence Committee to ask the intelligence chiefs to push back. I just wish you all could persuade the president as a matter of national security to separate these two issues. The collusion issue is over here, unresolved. We'll get to the bottom of that. But there's no doubt, as you all have testified today, and it w we cannot confront this threat, which is a serious one, with a whole-of-government response when the leader of the government continues to deny that it exists. The president inconveniently continues to deny the threat posed by Russia. He didn't increase sanctions on Russia when he had a chance to do so. He hasn't even tweeted a single concern. The Russia investigation is ongoing in three separate congressional committees plus the special counsel's office. And when the FBI director was asked if the bureau would ever share information from any of the probes with the president, Christopher Wray was clear. I'm not going to discuss the uh, investigation uh, in question with the president, or much less provide information from that investigation to him. Wray also acknowledged that President Trump has not directly ordered the FBI or any other agency to confront and stop Russian meddling. Of course, this led to more questions about why the president has remained silent when the intelligence chiefs stress throughout this hearing that the Russia threat remains prevalent and prominent. And that was Jessica Schneider in Washington. The police union says the number of officers being threatened with guns has increased by almost 40 percent in two years. It says criminals know how to exploit the current system, which licenses the owner, not the weapon. And as a result, too many firearms are ending up in the wrong hands. Researchers, the police and gun owners were among those to speak at today's Firearm and Public Health Conference. Charlie Drever was there. There was obvious tension between the pro- and anti-gun groups at the meeting in Wellington today. The Police Association President Chris Carhill received a somewhat frosty reception with the audience openly challenging his views on tighter gun controls. Mr Carhill says it's unacceptable that the current system means police have no idea how many firearms are in the country. Police explain that with no requirement for registering firearms and no obligation to provide police with firearm serial numbers, we can only estimate how many guns there are in New Zealand. Police is also unable to reveal how many firearms have been stolen because individual weapons are not tracked. While the sale of some weapons like military-style semi-automatics and pistols are restricted, Mr Carhill says there are no limits on the number of standard firearms people can buy with a licence. You might say Chris Carhill was, seems a fit and proper person and it's fine for him to have tens or hundreds of guns. But what about the patch member of the headhunters who legally amassed $30,000 worth of high-powered and semi-automatic rifles over three years? By the time the police went to revoke his licence and take his guns, he had already on sold them. Who knows where they ended up? But the founder of the firearm safety specialist, Nicole McKee, says Mr Carho has got it wrong. The number of firearms that you have, whether it's one or whether it's hundreds, as the police association alluded to, doesn't mean you can go out there and shoot them all at the same time. And those people that have those legally owned firearms are being constantly vetted by New Zealand police as to their behaviour. A police survey last year found one in eight officers had been threatened with a gun, a 38% increase since 2015. Those on the front line are even more at risk, with one-fifth saying they had been threatened in the past year. Mr Carhill says there needs to be a register of all firearms, especially when up to 55,000 guns are legally imported every year. 
Nicole McKee is worried about the so-called grey gun users, people who use firearms for things like hunting but don't get a licence. But she says education programmes like the one her group runs is the answer, not regulation. There is an opportunity to take our programme, the Whakatupatu programme, nationwide and get to more people in the grey gun sector to have them licensed, not their firearms, but them licensed and their firearms secured. I think there's an opportunity there that has not been fully realised. Mrs McKee says she's worried about the number of people at the conference who have a negative attitude towards gun ownership. In Wellington, for Checkpoint, Charlie Drever. There's growing concern that poor and middle-income families will miss out as more schools ask children to bring computers to class. Principals say charities often help people in the poorest communities and at the other end of the spectrum, high-income earners can afford to meet their children's technology needs. They say schools in the middle are having the most trouble bridging the digital divide. Here's our education correspondent, John Gerritsen. Schools are increasingly encouraging students to bring a computer and the cost for parents is adding up. It was a Chromebook for my daughter. Uh, it cost about $550. The fact that we have to put, you know, maybe three, four hundred dollars together every three or four years, I think that that's absolutely fantastic that we should take the opportunity to do that. We had to buy him a new one this year. The one that we got last year is now out of date and doesn't have enough capacity. If you can afford it, then that's great. It's certainly going to help with your kids' education, but I don't think you should be disenfranchised if you can't afford it. Michelle Whiting from Decile One Corinna School in Porirua says computers are too expensive for many families and her school's lucky to have the support of a local trust. A lot of private businesses offer deals but compounding interest is always a real problem for many of our families so it was really important to have a charitable trust support them in being able to take on a lease to buy scheme. The Porirua scheme is similar to Auckland's Manaya Kalani Trust, which helps families in Tamaki buy Chromebook computers for their children and also provides the community with wireless internet connections. The Trust's Executive Officer, Jenny Oxley, says there's growing demand for similar programmes in other parts of the country. Communities right across the country are struggling to get equitable access to learning for their young kids, and particularly as you know, digital teaching and learning becomes such a critical part of kids moving ahead in the digital world. Mike Williams from the Secondary Principals Association says schools can't require students to bring their own computers, though many encourage it. He says high decile schools can rely on most of their parents to pay for students' computers, and many low decile schools get help from charities for their technology costs. The schools that are probably struggling are the mid to lower decile schools who don't get the philanthropic support. Parents are still struggling themselves. They still want their students to have access to the devices because it really engages the kids. They can take the learning to another level, but they're probably trying to fund it themselves. And that's where the big challenge is. Mike Williams says teens need their own computers rather than devices supplied by their school, and the debate over who should pay will sharpen as more NCEA exams are offered online. Lawrence Miller from the 2020 Trust warns that the cost of a computer is often the least of the tech requirements that families must pay for. The larger financial investment is the internet connection. There's some potential challenges there about affordability for families. Generally, you're not going to get much less than $60 a month for an internet connection, which is a, a significant amount if it's not something that the family's budgeted for before and they're on a low income. Lawrence Miller says most internet packages require direct debit payments, and that doesn't work well for many poor families. For Checkpoint, John Gerritsen. Australia's Conservative National Party is in crisis with its leader Barnaby Joyce facing a mutiny from some MPs and senators who want him out. They believe he's been irreparably damaged by his relationship with a former staffer who is now pregnant with their child. But others say he's done nothing wrong and insist his position is safe. The ABC's Stephanie Boris is in Canberra and has been following the story. The National Party is in damage control. President Larry Anthony has arrived in Canberra to try and sort out the mess. This is a very difficult time for the National Party. Gosh, come on, speed up a bit. Um, but uh, the National Party always works through these issues. The pressure on Nationals leader Barnaby Joyce to resign has been mounting and now his colleague Ken O'Dowd has thrown more fuel on the fire. A lot of capable guys there and uh, 
we'd, if it came to the point that we would find a good leader. Mr O'Dowd represents the Queensland seat of Flynn. He believes the damage caused by Barnaby Joyce's relationship with a former staffer is irreversible. It's why he says some nationals will confront Mr Joyce about his options. I've heard, I heard there is going to be someone go across the seam. I think he, he, he'll probably need the advice and someone needs to tell him where the party stands at this stage and it'll be a cordial uh, you know, meeting. But it's not National Party style to roll a leader. MPs and senators don't want blood on their hands and some say Barnaby Joyce's popularity in regional Australia is too strong to force him out of the leadership. That's why some nationals, like Mr Joyce's close ally David Littleproud, are locking in their support. Let me say, if people uh, believe that Barnaby Joyce has broken the law, we'll lay charges. Otherwise, leave him and his family alone. If there's any, been any wrongdoing, uh, they should put up or shut up and let him and his family uh, enjoy the privacy that every other Australian enjoys. And an outspoken Queensland National MP has hit out at his own colleagues. George Christensen insists Barnaby Joyce is the party's best asset and the leadership discussion is hurting the government. While Liberals remain furious about Mr Joyce's situation and the oxygen it's sucking out of the Coalition's agenda, they're hoping the National Party sorts the situation out before next week when Barnaby Joyce is meant to be acting Prime Minister. Minister. Foreign Minister Julie Bishop has indicated she could step in if necessary. I do have plans to be overseas next week. Parliament is not sitting. Um, if circumstances change, then um, of course I would change plans, but that's not my understanding. And indeed, the usual procedures apply. If the Prime Minister is overseas, then the Deputy Prime Minister is acting Prime Minister. And if um, neither are in Australia or neither are available, then it goes down the line. I've been acting Prime Minister before in those circumstances. While National Party Whip Michelle Landry says Barnaby Joyce could easily take the week off as leave. He's got decisions to make and... Um you know, I think we need to leave, let him have a bit of personal time to sort this out. It is stressful. Marriage breakups are very stressful things to go through, um, but I think he's a very good leader. There are currently three camps within the Nationals when it comes to the future of Barnaby Joyce. Those who want him to resign, a few who strongly support him staying in the job, and others who think he should be given one last chance. And that's the ABC's Stephanie Boris in Canberra, and that is Checkpoint for this evening. Have a great night. NZ News headlines at 6.33. Senior National Party MPs have put their hats in the leadership ring today with more expected. The Health Minister says thousands of mental health and addiction workers are to receive the pay they deserve under a planned expansion of the Care and Support Pay Equity Settlement. The Tongan government says 4,500 people are being housed in evacuation centres after Cyclone Gita. And uh, the Labour Party's Deputy Leader Calvin Davis denies two Whangarei school.